In the previous video, we discussed how the spin of an electron corresponds to a possible physical implementation of a qubit. So what I want to do in this video is do a quick recap of what we covered and clarify some of the concepts we introduced, like probability amplitudes, superposition, and the measurement principle. So the first thing to recall is that to represent the spin of an electron in an arbitrary direction, we use a vector, let's call it S, with components S0 and S1. And perhaps we didn't mention this, but from now on, we're going to refer to this type of vectors as state vectors. And that's because, as the name implies, these are vectors that represent the state of our system. Now, these components S0 and S1, we said they're known as probability amplitudes, which are different from conventional probabilities because they can be either positive or negative numbers. But since our state vector has to describe this probabilistic behavior we observe when we measure the spin of an electron, we need a rule to convert these probability amplitudes to probabilities. And that is that the probability of measuring an electron deflecting in the plus C direction is equal to S0 squared, and the probability of that electron deflecting in the minus Z direction is S1 squared. So this is an additional rule that we need to go from probability amplitudes to probabilities. And this is something we didn't mention in the previous video, but this is known as the Born rule, and is named after Max Born, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for this observation. Now, because S0 squared and S1 squared are probabilities, then they must add up to one. And as we said, they can take positive or negative numbers. So they're actually real numbers. Now, later on, we'll see that more generally, these numbers actually can be complex valued, but we'll explain why this is the case. Now, we also looked at some very specific examples. So for instance, we looked at the electron spin pointing in the plus Z direction. And we said that we would assign a state vector of the form one zero. And that is because the probability of measuring that spin in the plus Z direction is S zero squared, which is one squared, which is equal to one. And the probability of measuring the electron spin in the minus Z direction is S one squared, which is zero squared, which is equal to zero, right? Similarly, for an electron pointing in the minus Z direction, we assigned a vector of the form zero one. And again, that's because it gives us a probability of deflecting in the plus Z direction of zero and of measuring in the minus Z direction of one. Now, more interestingly, we looked at an electron pointing in the plus X direction, right? So let's put some axis here. Let's say that this is the Z axis, this is the X axis, and this is the Y axis. So for this type of electron, we said that we have a state vector with components square root of one over two and square root of one over two. And that is because when we perform an experiment where we try to measure the spin in the plus Z direction, we see with probability of square root of one over two squared, which is equal to one half, uh, the electrons deflecting in the plus Z direction. And similarly, for the electron deflecting in the minus Z direction, we also see that about half of the time. And similarly, for an electron with spin in the minus X direction, we assigned a state vector with components of square root of one over two and minus square root of one over two, which again gives us similar probabilities to the ones we have for the electron with spin in the plus X direction, except this bottom one, we have a minus sign here, but because this is squared, we still get probabilities of a half and a half. And the reason we did this is because this gives us a consistent representation that allows us to express the spin along the Z direction as a linear combination of spins in the plus X and minus X direction. So for example, we can say that an electron with spin in the plus Z direction is equal to the linear combination of spin in the plus X and spin in the minus X direction. And when we replace the state vectors 
here for each of these components. This allows us to recover the state vector one zero that corresponded to spin in the plus Z direction. Now the next thing we discuss is that we can use the spin of an electron to represent what is known as the qubit. So we can say that the spin of an electron pointing in the plus Z direction could be associated with a state zero and the spin of an electron pointing in the minus C direction could be associated with a one. And this could actually serve just as a classical bit, right? We could use, for example, several electrons to construct classical binary numbers. And you know, the, the direction of each of the electrons would represent one of the bits. But what's interesting about the qubit is that it can also have a spin in the plus X and minus X direction where we associated what we call the state plus, which again can be represented as a linear combination of state zero and state one. And similarly for spin in the minus X direction, we call that state minus, which is also a linear combination of state zero and state one. And we say that these very special states are in what is known as a superposition. So a lot of times people say that a superposition is like having a qubit in both states zero and state one at the same time. But physically, all it really is, is for example, having an electron pointing in the plus X direction or in the minus X direction, for example. So that brings us to the very next important point, And is that superpositions are always relative to some set of states, which we call a basis. So in this particular case, the state plus, which we associate with the electron spin pointing in the plus X direction is in a superposition of state zero and state one, because we're representing this as if we were going to perform a measurement along the Z axis. But if we were to perform measurements along the X axis, we know that these two states are fully deterministic. The state for an electron in the plus X direction will always deflect to the plus X direction and a state pointing in the minus X direction would always deflect in the minus X direction. And we could actually represent this state zero and state one as superpositions of the plus and minus state. So this selection of having state zero and state one correspond to spin in the plus Z and minus Z direction is completely arbitrary. We could have equally assigned this to any other direction, but this is just a conventional way it's done. And it is also important to remember that here we use the spin of an electron because it's an easy way to visualize a qubit, but this could be implemented in many other ways. For example, with superconducting circuits where we use the energy levels of a nonlinear LC oscillator or using ion traps or the polarization of a photon. So to sum things up, we covered a few very important concepts in this video. We talked about state vectors, which are vectors that represent the state of a quantum system. Each of the components of this state vector is known as a probability amplitude, which when squared using the Born rule, give us the probability of observing the state vector in one of the two possible states. We can use these state vectors to represent qubits which are like conventional or classical bits, but can also be in superposition states, which are linear combinations of a selection or a set of states that we call the basis, which for example, in the case of the spin of an electron is a given orientation that we select to perform our measurements. So in the next video, we're going to describe how can we go from one of these possible qubit states to another, by using quantum gates. And then in the following video, we'll introduce another concept to this list, which will require two or more qubits. And that is the concept of entanglement. So thanks again for watching. And I hope to see you in the next video.